are on quark matter and relativistic hydrodynamics. Professor Huang receives his PhD in uh, 2008 in Tsinghua University in Beijing, in China. And from 2008 to 2013, he was postdoctoral researcher at the University of Frankfurt and at the Indiana University. In 2013, he's professor at the Fudan University in Shanghai. Here in our group, we have followed many of his works, in particular on QGP in strong magnetic field, strongly interacting matter under rotation, and last but not least, uh, his work on spin hydrodynamics. The title of his talk today is Vorticity and Spin Polarization in Heavy Ion Collisions. So before starting, let me also add some words to the organization of this webinar. The length of the talk is uh, maximum 19 minutes, plus 30 minutes of discussion. You can interrupt whenever you, do, uh, you don't understand. Uh, to do this, please raise your hand, your virtual hand, and wait until I call your name, then turn on your microphone and ask your question. You can also write uh, some comments in the chat um, if you want. And um, um, let us postpone long discussions to the end of the talk. And to keep the internet connection stable, please turn off your video cameras. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Professor Wang, you can start. If you want. Okay, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm very glad to uh, give a talk in this uh, uh, webinar series. Yeah, uh, uh, let me turn, turn off my video. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the vorticity and the spin polarization in uh, high ion collisions. Uh, I think I will first give a, a overview of the uh, uh, status of the topic and uh, I think I will mainly focus on uh, the works from uh, myself and my uh, collaborators. Uh, I think yeah one of the one of the uh, main motivations of the uh, this talk is that in uh, 2017, uh, 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 Star Collaboration published a paper uh, called the Global Lambda Hyperon Polarization in Nuclear Collisions, and uh, which reported for the first time the uh, measurement of the spin polarization of uh, uh, Lambda Hyperon. So here is the result. And uh, uh, this result, uh, was uh, later uh, reproduced from uh, theoretical calculation uh, based on uh, fluid vorticity. And uh, which means uh, uh, the polarization of lambda hyperon uh, is very probably uh, due to the appearance of the uh, strong fluid vorticity in the coagulon matter produced in uh, nuclear collisions. But then in the next year in uh, 2018 uh, and also in 2019, uh, there were more data from the experiment, uh, especially for the differential property of the polarization of lambda hyperon and also for the vector meson spin alignment. Uh, I, will inter, uh, uh, I will explain all those uh, uh, things in the following, but yeah, let me first uh, give you an uh, impression that what is the main problem here. And in the new data, uh, they found that, for example, the uh, longitudinal polarization would have a non-trivial azimuthal angle dependence, so it would uh, first uh, uh, positive uh, in, and then uh, drop to a negative value. This is not the case for the uh, vorticity. Actually, the vorticity shows the opposite trend comparing to the data. Uh, similarly, uh, simil uh, similarly for the transverse polarization as a function of the azimuthal angle, there is also a sign difference 
between the experimental data. Here, the data is this uh, square uh, symbols and uh, the uh, theoretical curve here, this uh, uh, dashed lines. And also for the vector meson spin alignment, like uh, uh, phi meson and uh, k star zero. <coughs> The experimental data is far away from the uh, one third. I will explain on why uh, usually it should be one third. And this, uh, the direction is so large that uh, cannot be uh, understood in terms of the uh, vorticity. And actually there's a, another problem is that uh, uh, we uh, expect that uh, the phi uh, meson spin alignment should be negative, but the data shows that it's, it's uh, positive. Okay, so which means uh, uh, now uh, there is a big uh, discrepancy uh, between theory and uh, experimental data, which is so far uh, not fully understood and uh, which uh, triggers a lot uh, of uh, uh, discussions and uh, also uh, motivates uh, the works that I will talk about in this talk. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, 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 this is the outline of, of my talk. So first I will give a, a discussion on the, some general uh, properties of uh, vorticity in heavy ion collisions. Then I will talk about how the vorticity can polarize the spin of, of hydrons. And uh, then I will talk about that uh, one, uh, uh, possible tool that may be used uh, for the future uh, to resolve the spin polarization uh, puzzles that I just uh, discussed. And finally, if the time uh, allows, I will talk about spin alignment and also a spin dependent hydrogen yield, which, which would also be uh, measured in uh, heavy collision. Finally, I will summarize Okay, so let's uh, start with the vorticity in heavy ion collisions. Uh, so first of all, what is uh, vorticity? Uh, I think everyone should be familiar with uh, fluid uh, vortices. So here I show you a coffee cup uh, with a, a rotating uh, coffee. So if you stir a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, you will see uh, the rotation of the coffee or tea and this rotation is uh, just a vortex. Uh, more precisely, uh, the vortex is a local rotation of the uh, fluid, and uh, the strength of the local rotation of the fluid is uh, described by the vorticity. So here is the uh, definition of the fluid vorticity in non-relativistic hydrodynamics. So which is actually just the, the angular velocity of the uh, fluid cell. So it uh, describes uh, how fast the, the fluid cell is rotating. Uh, and the, and the uh, fluid, uh, what is this uh, very common phenomena uh, in nature? Uh, for example, uh, the rotating galaxies can be considered as a, a big or uh, uh, fluid vortex uh, because the stars interacting through uh, gravity. So uh, the whole structure of the galaxy in some sense can be described by hydrodynamics. Also on Earth, we are uh, familiar with uh, uh, water uh, vortices and also there are uh, panodos and also the tea uh, vortex or coffee vortex. There's a uh, not all fully vortices. And in the macroscopic world, for example, in the superfluid helium-4, uh, there is also fluid vortex if the superfluid is, rotati is rotating. So here I show you uh, a figure showing that there is a uh, vortex lattice in a rotating superfluid. And in an even smaller system, uh, that is uh, the quark gluon matter created in the heavy ion collisions. There is also fluid vorticity, and that is the topic that we will 
uh, focus on this talk. Okay, then why do we expect that there is a, a fluid vorticity in heavy ion collisions? Uh, this is actually very easy to understand. Uh, we can consider a non-central heavy ion collision. Uh, its nuclear or its nucleus uh, uh, yeah, has a momentum along the z direction, that's the beam direction which is uh, about a the atomic number of the nucleus times the, the square root of s divided by two. And then if the uh, impact parameter is b, uh, then we see that there is a, a global angular momentum of this colliding uh, system, which is given by a times that's PZ times B. And uh, for the rate go to go to collision at 200 GeV, the impact parameter uh, 10 Fermi, uh, you can find that uh, this total angular momentum of the colliding uh, system is about to the six times AR. Uh, in number, this is a small number, um, but if you compare, this number to spin or the angular momentum of a single hydrogen, or even the hydrogen of the total produced, uh, or even the spin of, uh, even the angular momentum of, to, of the total produced uh, hydrons, this is actually a big number because uh, each bar is the uh, um, strength of uh, the spin of each hydrogen. Okay, so in this sense, uh, we can see that uh, uh, in high run collisions, uh, we have a, a the collider has a big angular momentum. Uh, of course, because the ions are charged, uh, when they move, they also a magnetic field. Uh, but in the following, I'm uh, not going to talk about the uh, effect of the strong magnetic field. So I will uh, focus solely on the angular momentum and the vertical state that field from the angular, mom, uh, angular momentum. Okay, then the question is, uh, after the collision, uh, there, appear the, there appears the quark-long uh, matter. And uh, a part of this uh, initial total angular momentum will be kept in the produced quark-long matter. Uh, but because the quark gluon matter is very soft, uh, its equation of state is uh, very soft, it's a uh, fluid. Uh, it cannot rotate as a, a rigid body. Uh, so this uh, part of angular momentum will be kept in the quark gluon matter uh, in the form of uh, uh, local uh, fluid vorticity. And uh, the question is how large this uh, local fluid vorticity uh, can be. Uh, the simulation for the fluid vorticity uh, in theory is uh, straightforward uh, because according to the definition, vorticity is nothing but the curve of the velocity field. And uh, the velocity field can be obtained by using either uh, hydrodynamics or uh, transit models like uh, uh, EMPT or YQMD or hydrogen. So here I show you the result from uh, some of the simulations. Uh, for example, in this simulation uh, by Zhang, uh, Lin, and uh, Liao, uh, you can see that uh, indeed there is a, a vorticity along the y direction. So y direction is uh, defined as the direction of the uh, total angular momentum. That is the direction uh, perpendicular to the reaction plan. And as time goes, the, the vorticity uh, decays. And that's simply because the system is uh, expanding and so the vorticity is uh, diluted. So also here I show you the calculation of the initial vorticity as a function of the uh, collision energy. Uh, at a low energy, the simulation 
uh, is done by using WRQMD and at high energy, the simulation is done by using hygiene. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, you can see that about, about uh, 10 GeV and the vorticity, the initial vorticity is a decreasing function of the collision energy. Yeah, this is a relativity effect. Uh, uh, that's it because what we show here is the uh, vorticity at mid rapidity. So uh, with increasing uh, collision energy, uh, the matter produced uh, in the mid rapidity uh, behaves uh, more and more uh, both the environment in the longitudinal direction. And we know that if the system becomes um, uh, fully uh, both the environment in the longitudinal direction, uh, then there cannot be a vorticity. So at, at a low energy, we do not uh, uh, expect the relativity play an important role. And indeed, in this region, we see that uh, the in initial vorticity increase with the collision energy. And there is a uh, turning point from the increasing and the decreasing trend of the vorticity, which is around uh, several GeV. Okay, those are some properties of the uh, vorticity. Uh, here, if you look at the number of the vorticity, you can uh, realize that uh, this vorticity uh, generated in high collision is actually uh, very big. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 rotating frequency, uh, this uh, vorticity at rig, for example, at uh, B equal to 10 Fermi is about 10 to the uh, 20 to 10 to the uh, 21 per second, uh, which is the uh, strongest uh, vorticity uh, that we have ever know for any uh, fluid. So here I show you a comparison uh, between uh, the vorticity in different uh, systems. So uh, in high van collision, we have the power coulomb plasma, the, the, the uh, strength of the vorticity is about 10 to the 20 to 10 to the 22 uh, per second, which is much more larger than any uh, vorticity uh, in other fluid. So in this sense, we, uh, uh, as we uh, already know that uh, we see that the quark long plasma is the uh, most vertical fluid. So here I only show uh, two, uh, three calculations, uh, the results from three calculations, but uh, and there, are, there were actually a lot of similar calculations. Uh, I cannot show all those results, um, but you can uh, look up the literature. Basically, all those uh, calculations uh, qualitatively uh, are consistent with each other. So namely, we have a very big uh, vorticity, uh, which uh, at a large collision energy decreasing with the energy. Okay, so, so this uh, uh, vorticity uh, at mid rapidity is basically due to the total angular momentum. But this is not the, the uh, unique uh, source for the vorticity. There are uh, other sources for the vorticity. Uh, for example, after the collision, the quark long uh, system will expand. And this expansion is not homogeneous. It's very inhomogeneous. And, the in, and for inhomogeneous expansion, uh, there would uh, appear a uh, vorticity. Uh, for example, uh, if you consider a uh, very inhomogeneous uh, expansion along the uh, Z direction, that's the uh, longitudinal direction, you can easily image that there would appear this uh, loop type uh, vorticity. Just uh, like uh, uh, if you uh, smoke, uh, you can uh, see the smoke loop uh, if you uh, yeah, that's uh, very similar. And of course, the system is also expanding in the transfer direction. This also there is a uh, vorticity. So this means uh, uh, there is al also vorticity generated by the fireball expansion. So here I show you uh, some 
uh, result. For example, uh, in the transverse plot, uh, the expansion would generate the, the uh, vorticity uh, circling the longitudinal uh, direction, that's circling the beam direction, like a, a loop vorticity, which uh, in one direction, uh, which, uh, which will circle the beam direction in one direction at uh, a positive rapidity region, and in the opposite direction at the opposite uh, rapidity region. Yeah, and also if we uh, look at uh, the vertical structure in the transverse plane, uh, we will see uh, that uh, there appear this uh, quadruple uh, structure for the vorticity along the uh, longitudinal direction. Uh, that's the longitudinal, longitudinal vorticity. Now here I show you the thermal vorticity, but basically this, uh, if you look at the kinematic uh, vorticity, that is the vorticity that I just uh, showed in the uh, previous uh, uh, slide, uh, which captures the uh, rotating frequency of the fluid cell, which also uh, sh uh, shows this quadruple structure in the transverse plane. Okay, so this is due to the uh, expansion in a non-central collision. Okay, and also uh, if you uh, consider a jet uh, propagating in the uh, viscous uh, medium, uh, then there would be a vorticity so, uh, around this uh, jet direction. And if there are many, many this uh, jet, and you will see uh, many, many this uh, sm small uh, structure of the vorticities. Uh, this was uh, first uh, uh, simulated by uh, those people. As I uh, said, uh, in heaven collisions, there is a strong uh, magnetic field. Uh, if the particle is uh, 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 charged, uh, or if the particle has a uh, uh, magnetic moment, uh, the magnetic field will polarize the spin of this of those uh, particle. Uh, during the polarization process, uh, the conservation of the angular momentum will uh, enforce the uh, whole system to rotate. Uh, in, that's uh, nothing but the Einstein, the Haas effect. So, which means uh, the magnetic field could be another source for the vorticity. Okay, so we see that in heaven collisions, uh, there are uh, several sources which could generate the vorticity, uh, especially uh, the global angular momentum uh, can generate a strong vorticity in the mid rapidity uh, regime along the direction perpendicular to the reaction plan. And also the favorable uh, expansion uh, can generate a quadruple uh, structure in the uh, Quadruple vertical structure in both the transverse plan and the, the uh, reaction plan. Okay, the question is how can we detect uh, all those vertical structure uh, in experiment? Or uh, what would be the consequence of the strong vorticity uh, in high run collisions? One very uh, nature, natural uh, consequence is the spin polarization which I will uh, focus on in the following. And uh, there would be other consequences like uh, the carol vortical effect, uh, carol vortical wheel, uh, which I will not uh, talk about. So in the following, I will focus on the spin uh, polarization uh, phenomenon. Okay, then uh, why the spin of a particle uh, can be polarized by uh, what is it? That is uh, due to the quantum mechanical spin orbit coupling. So if uh, a particle in a fluid is, uh, if a fluid is uh, uh, rotating, so uh, the cost constituted um, particle would also rotating, which uh, would generate a uh, orbital angular momentum. And then uh, due to the spin orbital coupling, uh, their spin would uh, be polarized. Uh, this idea was first uh, proposed by uh, Liang and Wang in uh, 
25, actually 20, 20, 24. And also uh, discussed the bioallergen in the same year. Uh, their idea can be uh, translated into the language of uh, autistic. So uh, let's consider a system of a particle with a spin, uh, whose spin is uh, given uh, S. If the system is not rotating, uh, we expect that there is no uh, anything special uh, happening. Uh, the spin up and the spin down states are uh, degenerate. But if the system is uh, rotating, uh, and the rotation will couple to the uh, angular momentum, so here the spin, and that's uh, change the uh, energy of the particle. And if we write down the uh, particle number distribu dis distribution, uh, for example, for the Boltzmann distribution, uh, we will see that uh, uh, the distribution will be changed due to the rotation. And if the rotation is very small, namely the rotation over the temperature is a small number, you, you can easily find that uh, in this case, the particle number along the direction of the rotation minus the particle number opposite to the direction of the rotation divided by the total particle number, which is defined as the spin polarization, which is a proportional to the omega divided by T. That's, that is the uh, rotating frequency divided by temperature. So in this sense, uh, we say that uh, if there is a rotation in a thermally equilibrium a system, uh, the spin of the system would be uh, polarized. So this argument can be uh, made, made uh, uh, rigorous. Uh, uh, for example, uh, following the statistica mechanica uh, way or following the kinetic uh, method, uh, you can derive a uh, uh, rigorous uh, formula for the spin polarization of a particle of a mass m uh, with momentum p uh, of a spin one half. Here I show you only the uh, result for spin one half. So here uh, this uh, 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 special omega uh, is called the thermal vorticity, which is defined uh, by the uh, gradient of the weight field. Weight field is the uh, velocity field divided by uh, temperature. Okay, so this is the thermal vorticity. And in the first order of this uh, thermal vorticity, uh, this formula uh, link, links the spin polarization of the particle and uh, how the uh, fluid is rotating, or how is the fluid is, uh, is vertical. Uh, here, f is the distribution function of the uh, particles. So in this case, uh, it's a fermi dirac distribution. I should uh, emphasize that this formula is derived under the assumption that the system is globally uh, equi uh, is at global equilibrium. And only in this case, the Thermal vorticity plays a rule like a chemical potential for spin. And in this case, the spin polarization is fully determined by the thermal vorticity. Uh, but if uh, in the reality, uh, maybe in the reality, in that the uh, matter produced in high collisions uh, do not reach the a global equilibrium for spin degree of freedom. And in that case, this formula may not be uh, applied. And uh, that is also an open question. Uh, that's in the non-equilibrium uh, situation, how can we uh, really calculate the spin polarization? Uh, I will discuss this later. Uh, also, uh, one advantage of this uh, formula is that uh, it can be easily uh, used for numerical simulation. 
uh, because you can consider this as a spin Cooper Fry formula. And then at the uh, hydronization or freeze out, you can use this to calculate how the hydrons uh, are polarized uh, by the fluid velocity uh, uh, in the system. Okay, so here I show you the result uh, from the theory by using this formula. Uh, that is the result for the global lambda spin polarization. So namely the spin polarization of lambda hyperon uh, integrated over all the kinematic region, uh, PT or set uh, azimuthal angle. So here is the experimental result published by star collaboration. And here I uh, collect four different uh, calculations for the global spin polarization as a function of uh, energy. So they are the uh, calculation from the uh, kinetic theory using the kinetic method and the calculation from the EMPT and the calculation from the hydrodynamics and also a hybrid model uh, of URQMD and a hydro uh, model. All those calculations, although quantitatively a little uh, different from each other, but overall they um, produce similar results. And uh, the result uh, uh, coincided with the experimental data. Here I show you also the data uh, pretty well. So here I also show you the calculation of the global polarization uh, at middle rapidity as a function of centrality. And also you can see that uh, the calculation uh, roughly reproduced the data. So in this sense, uh, uh, we can say that uh, the ex experimental data of the global lambda polarization could be well understood in terms of uh, uh, fluid vorticity. That's very, very good. Uh, oh, okay, another thing is that if you look at closely the experiment data, you can see that although there is a big error bar, but there is a difference between the polarization of lambda and anti-lambda. So this uh, difference is not uh, fully understood. And one possible reason uh, may be the uh, magnetic field uh, because lambda and anti-lambda have uh, opposite uh, magnetic moment. So they would be uh, polarized oppositely uh, under magnetic field. Okay, so, so we see that uh, the uh, data for the global lambda polarization can be well understood in terms of the uh, fluid vorticity. Ah, okay, so uh, last year there was a, a new result from the Hedis uh, collaboration. Uh, they measured the uh, uh, lambda polarization at uh, 2.4 uh, GeV. That's very low energy. Although the error bar is pretty large, um, but uh, roughly they uh, suggest that uh, uh, the polarization at very low energy uh, is very small. So which uh, comparing to the vorticity curve that I was showing you uh, in the beginning of this talk, you can see that indeed the, uh, in the sense of the uh, dependence of uh, uh, collision energy uh, are, are consistent with uh, each other. Yeah, so I think in future, it would be very interesting if uh, more data uh, from, uh, for example, Nika or FAIR or HEF or even the uh, phase two of the beam energy scan at RIG uh, for the uh, global lambda polarization can be uh, released. So we can really see whether the uh, global polarization as a function of uh, uh, collision energy would really uh, drop at low energy. Yeah, because yeah, if there is a uh, quality, uh, yeah, you, you know, if there is any, uh, there's a, a sharp difference uh, at some point, which would uh, mean there is something special, like we know that at some uh, collision energy regime, uh, the V1 slope of a proton or even key pi ratio or, or the kurtosis uh, fluctuation of the conserved quantities, uh, all show some uh, non-monotonic behavior. So if, the, if there is also 
similar non monotonic behavior in the lambda polarization, uh, it would be uh, interesting. So this is a for may the global I, lambda. So may yes, I ask yes. you a question? There is a question sure. in, the, in the chat room. So oh, sure. one of the participants, Animal Islam, ask you uh, whether the theoretical predictions are for lambda or lambda bar? Uh, so here the theoretical prediction does not distinguish lambda and uh, uh, lambda bar. So this <laughs> prediction is the same for lambda and lambda bar. Okay. And the other question is, um, if the magnetic field is supposed to be short-lived, can, uh, can it influence the lambda and lambda bar polarization? Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, if the magnetic field is very short-lived, uh, then it would have a little uh, effect on the polariz spin polarization of lambda and the lambda bar. But this is not, we are not sure how long the magnetic field can live in the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question from Mike Liza. Uh, is there any reason to believe polarization should vanish at production, at production threshold? Uh, can, can you say it again? There, uh, is there any reason to believe polarization mm -hmm. should vanish at production threshold? It means that uh, it's not monotonic behavior necessarily non-trivial. Uh, okay, so in the very low energy, we can consider at energy uh, square, square root of S equal to twice the nuclear mass, right? That's the lowest uh, energy we can have. In that case, basically there is no collision. So the system does not have any angular momentum. So we do not expect in that case, there is a spin polarization. I mean, uh, I would expect that there indeed should be this non monotonic behavior for the spin polarization. If the spin polarization is due to the uh, angular momentum. Yeah, because the angular moment should have this, this uh, at low energy, there is no angular moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so that is for the global lambda polarization. That's the uh, uh, lambda polarization integrated over the kinematic regions. So uh, in uh, 2018s and uh, in 2018 and 2019, uh, STAR and collaboration and Alice collaboration uh, reported new results, uh, which contains the information of differential lambda spin polarization. So in this, uh, from that data, we can see how the lambda polarization is distributed in different kinematic regions, like PT, uh, rapidity, and the azimuth angle. So in, in uh, for the PT dependence, uh, it seems uh, the calculation based on the uh, spin Cooper Fry uh, formula, that's the based on the vorticity, could uh, match the data. Uh, I think, it, well, yeah, for both PT dependence and uh, uh, rapidity dependence. Uh, but this is for the rapidity between uh, minus and uh, positive, uh, minus one and uh, plus one. Uh, if we go really large rapidity uh, uh, for the vorticity, this is the calculation by using hedging. We see that uh, there is a very non-trivial rapidity dependence of the initial uh, vorticity. Um, but the, from the data, we see that there is no this uh, strong de uh, rapidity dependence, uh, at least. Uh, in between uh, minus and positive um, plus one. So this would mean that the uh, variable evolution due to the hydrodynamics, the hydrodynamic evolution variable somehow uh, uh, stretched the uh, uh, non-trivial uh, rapid dependence of the vorticity. Yeah, but in, the, uh, in another calculation, the final uh, polarization uh, of the final polarization by using a hydrodynamic model, uh, which uh, shows that at, at large uh, rapidity, the polarization is actually uh, larger than that at uh, middle rapidity. So I think uh, so, uh, maybe in future, uh, if the uh, polarization at a very large rapidity can be measured, this uh, could be uh, interesting. 
Okay, that's the, is the differential uh, lambda polarization uh, as a function of PT or uh, rapidity, which uh, roughly, uh, which can roughly be uh, understood in terms of the vorticity. However, there is a very uh, big puzzle for the lambda spin polarization as a function of the azimuth angle phi. So in this case, we can, as, what, as, as we do, as we usually do for the particle number distribution, we can also do the harmonic uh, expansion of the uh, spin polarization. Here I show the harmonic expansion of the spin polarization in the y direction and the z direction, that's the beam direction. Okay, so we would expect that there is this uh, harmonic expansion and uh, uh, from the theoretical calculation, the harmonic coefficient f, the fz, that's the longitudinal uh, polarization should be uh, negative, okay? Also, the uh, transverse polarization, py, as a function of phi uh, from theory would also lead to a negative uh, harmonic coefficient g. However, from the data, uh, the data shows that uh, the fz, f2z coefficient, harmonic coefficient, and uh, the g2y harmonic coefficient are both positive, which strongly uh, uh, contradicts with the uh, uh, theoretical calculation. And uh, thus, uh, this is, uh, is a big puzzle uh, in the uh, local uh, spin polarization of lambda or spin polarization of lambda as a function of the azimuth angle. So this is a big puzzle uh, which uh, is so far not understood, <coughs> which, is, which is not, understand, not understood. Uh, to understand the uh, discrepancy in the uh, Azimuth angle dependence of a lambda spin polarization. And there are a lot of, uh, uh, I think from the theoretical uh, point of view, there are a lot of things that we uh, need to consider. The first thing is that we need to make sure that we really understand some property of the uh, vorticity. I think at this uh, part, it, it is okay to see that uh, uh, if the initial condition is given, the vorticity is uh, is fully understood from the, if we trust the, the hydrodynamic model or transfer the models. And also we need to really understand how big the contribution from the fake down the key uh, is in the, the uh, uh, spin polarization. Uh, that is because in the theoretical calculation based on the spin Fry formula, uh, the decay contribution is uh, usually not included. However, uh, the measured lambda uh, may be from the decays of some uh, heavier particles. So we need to, uh, during this uh, decay process, the spin of lambda, the spin would be transferred from the mother particle to lambda. And this transfer may change the spin polarization of lambda. So this would contribute the final spin polarization and it would uh, be an important thing to, uh, for the uh, uh, angle dependence of lambda spin polarization. So we will discuss this later. And also in the theoretical calculation so far, uh, we, people use the spin group fry formula based on the equilibrium assumption. And uh, in this case, the spin is uh, enslaved to the thermal vorticity. However, in the realistic uh, case, uh, the matter in the high uh, may not reach uh, uh, equilibrium and the spin may not be uh, enslaved to the thermal vorticity, which uh, should be, which means spin should be uh, treated as an independent degree of freedom. Uh, so we need to develop some new framework to uh, study the spin dynamics. 
Uh, one uh, promising uh, framework is the hydrodynamics. Uh, in this case, we need to develop a spin hydrodynamics. And another framework is the kinetic theory. So we need a uh, spin kinetic theory. In the following, I will talk about the spin uh, hydrodynamics. And also, we also need to understand the initial condition, uh, namely whether there is uh, already some per, um, process in the initial stage that already polarized the spin of the patterns, or if the initial uh, flow could have some special pattern which can polarize the uh, particle. Uh, there are also other possibilities that were discussed recently. For example, uh, the polarization uh, due to, uh, related to the uh, chiral-vertical effect or if there is a strong field, uh, namely the uh, strangeness uh, Masonic mean field, which could also play some role in the polarization, uh, which would contribute to the final polarization of the hydrons. Uh, and also whether there is uh, some other spin chemical potential, as we uh, cite uh, in the spin uh, Cooper Fry formula, the thermal uh, vorticity is a kind of a spin chemical potential. Uh, however, if we consider uh, that uh, the situation, that uh, the system is not uh, at a global equilibrium, uh, whether we can choose some other spin chemical potential. This was uh, discussed recently. And uh, indeed, in some cases, uh, by choosing a different spin chemical potential, uh, we can uh, resolve the spin, uh, uh, the sign, spin sign um, problem. But of course, then the problem is why uh, those spin chemical potential should be chosen. And of course, if there are some other observables for vorticity and the spin polarization, which would also very uh, helpful for us to understand those puzzles. One of those uh, observables is the vector meson spin alignment, uh, which uh, was first uh, proposed uh, also by Liang and Wang and recently uh, reported, uh, the, the measurement was reported by STAR and ALICE collaboration. And I, uh, also there would be some other uh, observables, for example, the hydrogen yield, uh, the vorticity dependent hydrogen yield. I will talk about this later. Okay, so let's first consider feed down effect, whether the feed down effect can be a reason for the uh, spin uh, sign problem. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, from the thermal model calculation, uh, we see. Can I ask a quick question? Um, yes. Can I ask a quick question? Since you mentioned that, I mean, you people mentioned the chiral vertical effect, like it's a different effect from you know the vorticity driven polarization that you talked about. But mm -hmm. are they really distinguishable? I mean, it's the same. It's the same sign for particle and antiparticle. It's both driven by vortices. Um, I am, it's not anomalous. So what's the difference? Uh, in principle, uh, of course, Karawatka effect uh, arises also due to a kind of a spin polarization. Uh, but I think <coughs> in, their, in their work, the difference is that they can introduce additional uh, quantity like the uh, Carol chemical potential. Oh. In, in, in a word, uh, if you uh, introduce some new quality like Carol uh, chemical potential, which means you yeah, 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 some... yeah. But this is, I mean, I feel that there is some uh, semantics there because in the Cooper Fry formula, you put in that the uh, exponent of the Maxwell, uh, the exponent in the Maxwell distribution function, the Boltzmann distribution function, um, mm -hmm. depends on spin. Mm -hmm. um, that's basically the same thing as the chiral chemical potential. You can call it difference in energy due to spin and vorticity. You can call it chiral chemical potential. It's the same thing. You mean this omega dot g term? Yeah. It's the coupling in a between. fermionic representation, it becomes a chiral chemical potential, no? Mm. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think so. 
it's not a trivial it's not a trivial thing and uh, I think that there is some double counting certainly at the level of you know accounting for experimental data that's yeah sorry yeah, for, you, I mean, for, is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for example for the chiral chemical um, potential they can be considered as the effect of gluon field they, they are from the gluon gluon field uh, if you have a non-trivial non uh, Reading number of the gluon field, uh, then the gluon field can decay into into a, a system with a, a non-zero uh, chiral chemical potential. I think this effect is uh, different from the spin polarization simply by uh, vorticity. So, which means that should be an additional, at least some additional effect in yeah, the chiral vortical. I mean, at freeze out, you see lambdas. You don't see gluons. Lambda is a fermion, so it has a chiral chemical potential. So it has a chiral chemical potential. I mean, at the end, yes, the dynamics of the gluons will influence the hydrodynamics mm -hmm. in a complicated way. But um, at the end, you can parameterize all of this by introducing a chiral chemical potential at the level of freeze out. Mm -hmm. um, as long as yeah, you're not looking depends. at at yeah. particles, at photons or something. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's also, I think I would be. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so, okay, let me continue. Careful <laughs> for this lambda observable effect, I think. Ah. I just ah. wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Right, if, uh, if you consider chiral chemical potential, you put the chiral chemical potential into the freeze out formula and consider some, some special dependence of this chiral chem chemical potential, you can have a chance to resolve some this puzzle. Okay, so let me continue. Uh, from the uh, calculation, uh, about 80% of the final lambdas are actually from the decays of uh, high-lying particles, like a cascade and a sigma. And in some of these decay channels, the spin can be flipped, namely uh, the spin of the uh, parent particle and the spin of the uh, produced lambda could be opposite. For example, in the electromagnetic decay channel of uh, uh, sigma zero to lambda and uh, gamma, uh, in this decay due to the uh, angular momentum conservation, uh, the produced lambda must uh, have its spin opposite to, I mean, statistically opposite to the direct the spin direction of sigma. So which means in this process, we would have a, a spin a flip, flipping. And of course, if there is a, a spin flipping, which means if we uh, calculate the spin polarization of uh, sigma by using vorticity, uh, but uh, the produced lambda spin would be actually opposite, uh, which means the produced lambda spin would be the same as uh, uh, yeah, the spin, the sign, the sign will change. So we should would produce some contribution to the to the res, re, resolution of the spin uh, sign problem. Okay, so let us exam, uh, examine examine uh, the decay contributions. So let's consider a two body decay, a parent particle decay into a daughter particle, which would be assumed to be lambda, and uh, any other particle. Uh, we can define the spin uh, matrix uh, in the final state and write this uh, spin density matrix uh, in terms of the initial state, in initial, the parent particle spin state uh, times the, the transfer matrix. And uh, if the spin density matrix is obtained, the spin polarization of the daughter particle is easily. Uh, calculated. 
Uh, for example, uh, for this uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, decay, the initial spin density matrix, is, uh, if it, it is polarized, uh, would be given in this form. And after some calculation, uh, one can find that the final state spin uh, density matrix is given by this formula. The interesting thing is that uh, this uh, spin, final state spin density matrix is determined solely uh, by angular momentum conservation and the parity conservation. It's independent of the dynamics. And uh, uh, trace out the lambda, uh, the x uh, indices, we can obtain this uh, uh, spin density matrix for the particle D, that's the lambda. And then the spin polarization given by this formula. Yeah, this formula was first uh, de uh, derived by uh, Gatton uh, in 1958, uh, but using this for, uh, formalism, we can easily reproduce his result. So we considered all uh, several uh, decay channels, uh, four strong decays, one weak decays, and one electromagnetic decays, and uh, uh, calculated all this uh, decay uh, spin transfer, the spin transfers in all these uh, decay channels. And, use, and we use this uh, information to study how the uh, feed-on correction, uh, yeah, how, how the feed-on correction is. So here we, uh, here's the result. Uh, as you can uh, see from the figure that although uh, most of the final state lambda are from the decay of high lying particles, the spin polarization of lambda is very uh, uh, changed by the decay process. So it only changed about 10% of the spin polarization of lambda. So the same conclusion was also uh, obtained by uh, Bagatini, Cao, and uh, Sibraza uh, last year. This is for the longitudinal polarization. Similarly, for the transverse polarization, we obtained a similar conclusion. So namely, although most of the lambdas are from the decays of some heavier particles, but the lambda polarization uh, is not uh, changed uh, much by the decay process. So which means the feed-down effect cannot uh, solve the spin sign problem. Okay, then I think uh, in future, a uh, very uh, pro uh, uh, possible tool that can be used to uh, test, um, I mean, or solve the spin sign problem would be the spin hydrodynamics. So in the framework of spin hydrodynamics, uh, spin is treated as a, a quasi-hydrodynamic variable. Uh, in fact, uh, in non-relativistic uh, uh, physics, like the spin tronics and the micropolar fluid, uh, spin hydrodynamics is already uh, 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 commonly used in, in those areas. So here, I sh uh, for example, this uh, uh, paper, they use the spin hydrodynamics to, inter uh, to explain their uh, experimental uh, funding. And also, this is a very nice book uh, about the micropo micropolar fluid, the hydrodynamics for micropolar fluid, which is actually just uh, the spin hydrodynamics. So in the relativistic case, the, uh, the spin hydrodynamics was uh, introduced by Flokovsky and uh, his collaborators uh, two years ago. So they consider spin as a conserved mode uh, so that they can uh, write down uh, the ideal uh, hydrodynamics for spin. Of course, there is, should be the angular momentum conservation. So here, as lambda mu nu is the spin tensor, uh, in their setup, they, because they consider spin as a, a conserved mode, they write this uh, as lambda mu nu in terms of the fluid velocity, uh, u lambda times those uh, qualities which can be considered as uh, a spin density. And uh, 
so there's two uh, set of equations from uh, a plus uh, given equation of state would uh, form a system of uh, ideal spin hydrodynamics. Uh, of course, there were also some uh, other uh, considerations for the ideal spin hydrodynamics by motor uh, Montenegro and I, I think uh, George Torre um, in these two papers and uh, Flokowski and uh, his collaborators also have uh, uh, following up uh, development along this uh, line. So uh, this is uh, the ideal spin hydrodynamics. We can consider the uh, dissipative effect in the hydrodynamics just like we, how we develop the usual hydrodynamics, which means we need to consider higher uh, derivative uh, terms in the uh, derivative expansion. So uh, in develop of uh, the hydrodynamics, the first uh, step is to identify the hydrodynamic mode. Uh, in this case, actually, uh, strictly speaking, or in general, uh, spin itself is not conserved uh, because we know that the total angular momentum uh, is conserved, which contains both spin and the orbital angular momentum. Uh, so in, in, in this sense, uh, spin degree of freedom is not a, a exact hydrodynamic mode. Uh, it is a quasi-hydrodynamic mode if the relaxation time is uh, uh, long enough for the spin density. Uh, in this case, uh, we can identify those uh, quasi-hydrodynamic variables as uh, uh, temperature and uh, fluid velocity. That's the usual hydrodynamic mode. And also uh, six uh, spin chemical potential, omega mu nu here. So it, can, it, it, it contains three uh, variables for rotation and three variables for boost. Okay, and then we can write down the energy momentum tensor and the spin tensor and uh, keep only the leading uh, non trivial or uh, leading order in the, uh, sorry, the sub leading order in the derivative expansion. So we can and then apply the second law of uh, uh, thermodynamics uh, to require that all the, uh, uh, the, the entropy production should always be positive. Uh, we can obtain the constitutive relations for the spin hydrodynamics. So here I just show you the result. The interesting thing is that in this case, the angular momentum, uh, sorry, the energy, energy, the stress tensor, energy momentum uh, tensor uh, would have uh, uh, several different uh, contributions at the first order of gradient uh, expansion. So they can be identified as the usual, usual heat current, uh, shear viscosity, uh, bunk viscosity, and the two new transport coefficient. One is uh, uh, corresponding to the rotation of the fluid. That's what we call the rotational viscosity. And another is corresponding to the boost of the fluid cell. So which we call the uh, boost heat uh, current or Lambda is called the both heat conductivity. And uh, then the hydrodynamic equations are given by the conservation of the energy momentum tensor and the conservation of the angular momentum tensor. And also the equation of state, which links the pressure uh, to the energy, energy density and the spin density. Okay, so this form a closed set for the uh, disparity of spin hydrodynamics. But we know that in this setup, uh, the hydrodynamic equations are not stable and uh, numerically. Uh, so to form a stable uh, set of equations, we need to uh, consider some uh, higher order contribution, some higher order terms. The easiest way to uh, achieve this is by considering the issue Stewart type theory. So we can introduce the re relaxation time for all those uh, dissipative terms. 
uh, and in this way we can form a numerically stable and uh, causal uh, set of uh, uh, hydrodynamic equations. Uh, okay, so recently there uh, is also a development for the dissipative spin hydrodynamics by, but using some different uh, uh, setup by uh, Flokovsky and by uh, uh, Shu Shi, uh, Charles Gill and uh, Sanyang Zhang uh, this year. Uh, sorry, there is a question. This is Farid yes, sure. Joyna Lawas, the question. Farid? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a question about this uh, spin tensor. Is this a spin tensor is a quasi-spin tensor or uh, a real spin tensor? Since we know that spin tensor should should be a conserved current, but you wrote that uh, this proportional to the uh, anti-symmetric part of the energy momentum tensor. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's a good uh, question. Uh, in writing the spin tensor, actually, uh, there's no uh, unique uh, way to choose the form for the spin tensor. Yeah, because we only know the total angular momentum is conserved. And uh, there is an ambiguity in separating the spin part and the orbital part in the total angular momentum. Uh, in some uh, situation, uh, you can make the spin as a, a conservative quality, like uh, what uh, has been done by uh, Flokovsky. In this case, uh, they consider the spin tensor as a really a conserved uh, current. But uh, uh, in general, if uh, you allow the energy momentum tensor to have an anti-symmetric part, uh, the spin tensor uh, itself is not a conserved uh, current, uh, which means in, in, in this case, spin is not a hydro, exact hydrodynamic mode. I, I, yeah, so I mean, you you can construct a different uh, type of uh, mm -hmm. equations by choosing different uh, form for the spin tensor. That is possible. But to meet the anti-symmetric uh, energy momentum tensor does not make sense because we know that um, due to some symmetry arguments, we have to have a symmetric energy momentum tensor component. But uh, in in a frame, I, as you mentioned, we can uh, write this type of equation. How do you um, explain this to seemingly contradicting issues? Uh, for me, I don't, I don't, I don't know whether there is a very general argument that uh, energy momentum tensor must be symmetric. The only, the only thing I know that if uh, you couple uh, energy momentum tensor to a gravity. Uh, uh, in that case, uh, of course, energy momentum tensor must be symmetric because the uh, metric tensor, uh, because the metric is symmetric. But otherwise, I don't know whether there is a fundamental uh, physical principle which uh, require energy momentum tensor to be symmetric. The, the, can I make a comment just so? Uh, um, I think that the issue isn't so much the symmetry of the energy momentum tensor. The issue is that, as you said, the division between the symmetric and the anti-symmetric part is not uniquely physically defined. It's a pseudo yes. gauge transformation. Yes, and yes. if the underlying theory, but it gets worse, because if the underlying theory is gauge invariant, it also becomes becomes a gauge transformation. And in these approaches, I mean, I think the problem, I'm very skeptical of, these appro of, of the approaches that you cite, because in these approaches, you usually find that you get gauge dependence of observables. The theory only works in a certain gauge and the observable depends on the gauge. How you define the vorticity and how, do you, how you define the exponent in the Boltzmann distribution depends on the gauge. So what, well, what do I mean, you mean by gauge? That, that they, 
I mean uh, what you call vorticity and what you call spin. Gauge symmetry, what gauge symmetry is physically is that one component of the spin is not well defined. It mixes with angular momentum. And you can choose how it oh, makes. Yes, that's and a that's a usually called it. Yeah. So so the okay. And physics should be gauge invariant. But vorticity and spin go into these Wigner functions and whatnot in very different ways in these gradients. And so in approaches based on conservation laws and on things like Wigner functions, you almost always violate gauge invariance. I haven't seen a gauge invariant approach yet. This is the main motivation. I mean, you mentioned our work with David Montenegro. This is the main motivation for considering Lagrangians because we know how to make Lagrangians gauge invariant. Um, I think this is, this, this is somehow like uh, uh, what uh, we have for the uh, proton spin uh, puzzle. <laughs> you can define the... You, you can, but you need the... You, you, can define, you can define if you have a fixed frame. If you have a dynamically yeah, yeah, evolved I, frame, I, yeah. you cannot. Yeah. Yeah, I, these I, equations yeah. that you're showing on these slides, these equations that you're showing on these slides, you might have issues if you have a gauge theory because when you change gauge, what you call angular momentum and you, what, what you call spin in these equations will be different. And the, the yes, conservative the, yeah, that, that's a, uh, of the Yeah, that's a cost true. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. I think the point is that uh, you can choose uh, what kind of a spin uh, tensor as you want. Because finally, the whole system does not care how, how you describe it. You can choose a different kind of a spin, spin tensor. Uh, yes, but I, I agree. But the question is, if you make two different choices, is your physics the same? I'm not sure it is in these in the, I'm not sure it is in these equations in that slide. Yeah, from the equation, of course, uh, uh, the equation would be different if you choose different uh, uh, gauge. Uh, however, uh, in describing a system, uh, not only those equation is necessary, but also how you choose the initial condition or boundary condition. So if you, at the same time, if you change the gauge, you change the equation of, uh, you, you change the hydrodynamic, uh, for example, hydrodynamic equations, which means you also need to uh, change your initial condition or boundary condition so that they together would uh, give you a uh, gauge invariant description of the system. Um, that might work. That yeah. might work. I mean, I've seen in, in, these, pap in these papers, they show things like to first order and gradient, this is gauge invariant. Um, what you are saying might, what you are saying might work. I've just never seen, never really seen it uh, explicitly shown. And it's a serious okay. issue. And it's especially a serious issue if you are considering non-abelian gauge theories. You're right that you're talking about the proton spin puzzle there you have the infinite momentum frame, which is sort of natural, and therefore you can do a decomposition. But in hydrodynamics, there is no such thing as the infinite momentum frame. You see what I mean? I mean, it's a co-moving frame, which yeah, is I agree a that this is, evolution. Yeah, this is a, a very interesting uh, issue. And uh, to, to my understanding, it's not fully understood. Sure, sure. Yeah. I'm um, so, sorry, uh, yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, what, what we have done is for a specific uh, choice of the spin uh, tensor or in a word uh, for a specific choice of the gauge. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's continue. Yes, okay. Yeah, okay, so when we have the hydrodynamic equation, uh, we can use uh, the hydrodynamic equation to uh, do a calculation. Uh, but first, uh, we can see that uh, in this uh, hydrodynamic, it's been hydrodynamics, there appear a new uh, uh, collective mode. Uh, in the first uh, two lines, we see that uh, there are nothing but uh, how the spin is uh, uh, relaxed to, uh, is relaxed in the uh, system because they are in the setup, they are not conserved. 
So they will relax to, to zero, actually, if there is no uh, spin finite spin chemical potential. And also, I think what would be important is that. Uh, I mean, I mean, um, sorry, can I just because this is this is just a very brief thing. I mean, your first equation is longitudinal spin damping. <laughs> That's not <laughs> gauge invariant. That's where the problem is because longitudinal sure, yeah, spin sure, is sure, this is this is quantity. Sure, <laughs> this is, this depends on again again. This is only for our theory, for our choice of for our choice choice of the spin tensor. And for our case, there is an anti-symmetric part of the energy momentum tensor. Then you have this uh, two mode. If you choose the symmetric energy momentum tensor so that you have a conserved spin degree freedom, then you don't have this uh, two mode because in that case, spin is a hydrodynamic mode. Yeah, you're right. That, that, these two, this two um, modes appear uh, because we yeah, we choose that form of uh, uh, spin tensor and energy momentum tensor. Okay, uh, then we, in the future, we may use the spin hydrodynamics to attack the uh, spin sign uh, problem. I think, uh, for example, uh, if a spin, if uh, in the spin hydrodynamic spin is a quasi, is a quasi hydrodynamic mode, so which would be somehow like a, a charge, which means if the system is expanding, we will have a positive uh, spin uh, elliptic flow. And for a positive spin elliptic flow, uh, which actually is just uh, this uh, exper experimental curve. So which means by using this uh, spin hydrodynamics, uh, we have a very, I think, very good chance to resolve the uh, at least uh, this uh, transverse spin uh, polarization puzzle. Of course, uh, uh, this uh, is uh, uh, just the beginning. There would be more work uh, to be done. Uh, for example, we need to const uh, construct a fully causal and stable uh, second order spin hydrodynamics. And oh, as uh, Giorgio and uh, uh, mentioned there is a, a frame choice and a pseudo gauge choice, and uh, especially uh, for some uh, special gauge, uh, the the form of the spin hydrodynamics would be very different. And uh, whether the uh, then how how can we match different uh, choice of the uh, gauge would be uh, also uh, future works. And also uh, in the spin hydrodynamics, we have new transport coefficient. The calculation of those new transport coefficient would give us a new insight uh, to uh, QCD. Uh, and also if there's a magnetic field and if there's a very strong vorticity, uh, uh, we could have a different uh, gradient power counting and that would also lead to different set of uh, spin hydrodynamic equations. And recently, uh, there, as I already mentioned, there is some uh, uh, attempt to derive spin hydrodynamics from uh, kinetic theory and from holographic method. And of course, a very important thing is that we need to use the spin hydrodynamic to resolve the spin sign problem. Uh, I think I, yeah, okay, let me quickly go through the this, uh, this part, uh, the other observables. So one uh, important observable that we may be used to uh, detect the vorticity of spin polarization is the vector meson spin alignment, like uh, phi meson spin alignment. Uh, because phi meson is spin one in a uh, vertical fluid, it can also be polarized. Uh, consider a uh, recovery nation process uh, of a quark and anti-quark to fire, to fire meson. Uh, you can write down the spin, uh, that's the matrix of quark. And then you can write down the spin, that's the matrix of phi in terms of uh, uh, spin triplet and the spin uh, singlet state. And uh, only choose the spin triplet part, you can see the uh, phi meson 
uh, spin density matrix. And uh, the row zero zero component of this uh, spin density matrix is uh, what uh, we what uh, the experimental list uh, would uh, uh, measure. So which uh, from this uh, formula derived by Liang and uh, Wang, you can see that usually this uh, row zero zero would uh, be smaller than uh, one third. And because the spin polarization of a quark, this PQ, uh, should be proportional to the vorticity. And we are already know that the spin polarization is a, a few percent effect. So which means that this row zero zero should be very close to one third. Uh, however, uh, the data shows that uh, the row zero zero of a uh, five meson in the most uh, region of uh, centrality uh, is actually far from one third. Yeah, this, uh, this is a puzzle uh, we, which cannot be understood in terms of, of the vorticity. So whether there are some other contribution like uh, maybe magnetic field contribution or Masonic uh, field contribution recently there was a discussion about this possibility and also are some other contribution. So another uh, property of the five spin alignment is that uh, there's no significant energy dependence of row zero zero. Yeah, this is actually, uh, this is very different from the lambda spin polarization, which decays as, mom as energy increases. But this uh, feature uh, can be understood in terms of the vorticity, as I showed here, actually the, or the polarization uh, times the rapidity sign is uh, uh, roughly uh, the same at different uh, energy. So that, that, is, that is because at uh, uh, finite rapidity in the positive rapidity you will have one sign and at the, the, the negative rapidity you will have another sign. So if you make the product, they actually found, they actually does not uh, change much as uh, energy changes. And the, which means if you square, make a square of the polarization, this polarization, uh, this, this uh, square of the polarization would also not change much as the energy changes. And this is also, this can be, uh, this is consistent with the feature of row zero zero. However, in the previous studies, there is one thing which uh, uh, should be uh, reconsidered. Uh, that is uh, the assumption that all the quarks are polarized along the y direction. Actually, we already see that due to the expansion of the variable, there is uh, also this uh, circleized circle uh, uh, vorticity, which means there would be circleized polarization. And if you consider this into account, you will find that row zero, row zero, zero actually given by this formula. There is also a contribution from the polarization along X and Z direction. And if this is the case, uh, if you uh, calculate row zero, zero uh, by using the vertex state, you found that uh, there is a interesting uh, cosine ship uh, de dependence of uh, the azimuthal angle. And uh, uh, this, uh, this is for the central collision, actually. Uh, this uh, should be well testable. So, and the, 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 this ship is a consequence of the circular vorticity here. So uh, I hope the experimentalist could uh, take a look of the real zero zero uh, at uh, uh, where, uh, central events as a function of the Azimuth angle. So another possible observable is the hydrogen yield. Uh, this is because we see that at least at the equilibrium, uh, thermal vorticity is the spin chemical potential. It uh, determines how much the spin is polarized, uh, which means uh, uh, for different uh, hydrons uh, with different uh, spin, like spin one or spin three half or spin zero uh, hydrons, in a vertical fluid, uh, their yield will be different. Yeah, it's very easy to, de to derive this formula by using both the statistical, more, uh, 
statistical hydrogenization model and a collapses model, uh, you will see that uh, in a vertical fluid, uh, the yield of, of, uh, of the hydro of a spin S uh, would be different from the yield in a non vertical fluid by amount of omega over T square. So here are some uh, numerical results, uh, as you can see, because om omega over T uh, would be, according to the numerical simulation, would be roughly uh, one, 0 0.1 effect. So this means this effect would be roughly a few percent, uh, which should be testable in experiment. Okay, let me uh, summarize. So we say that in high collisions due to both the global angular momentum of the gliding system or due to some other sources like the inhomogeneous expansion of the fair ball, uh, there would appear a strong vertical fluid, strong vertical fluid. Uh, and this uh, strong vertical fluid could uh, have an interesting uh, effect on the uh, spin polarization of uh, both hyperons and the vector mesons. Of course, there would be other effects due to the vorticity, which I uh, didn't uh, talk about, like the terawattic effect, terawattic wave, and also uh, its effect on the QCD phase diagram. So overall, we could see that now uh, we have a, 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 we can see that uh, for our high ion collision physics, we we are going from the electro ele ele uh, electronics era to spintronics era because now we can use spin to uh, detect some uh, special properties of the uh, coagulometer. Of course, there are still those uh, big puzzles like spin sign problem and uh, spin uh, alignment of a uh, vector meson. Yeah, but uh, this also uh, enforces us to uh, consider uh, new uh, theoretical tools or new physics. Right? So, there are also opportunities for us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And uh, I thank see you. that there are some questions. So Mike, Liza, please. Uh, hi. Hey, listen, that hi, was hi, a, really nice, a really nice seminar. Thanks very much. Let me uh, okay. ask, I'm very interested in the low uh, root S dependence of the polarization. If you could go back to this, um, I think, you mentioned, you know, the non-monotonic uh, behavior at low root S, and you said, well, uh, some other interesting things are happening there. I mean, for example, you might be having in mind the net baryon fluctuations or so. But I guess, you know, since URQMD just shows this effect already, then it need not be associated with any kind of exotic physics. Um, mm -hmm. I have another question, but let me just ask if, if you agree with that. What, 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 okay, what, what do you mean by other exotic? Uh... Um, you know, things like critical point or, um, yeah, let's say critical uh, behavior, which, mm -hmm. you know, non monotonic behavior at those energies, one is often mm -hmm. thinking mm -hmm. about critical. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, uh, since I see this non monotonic uh, polarization in your QMD, I would say, oh, it probably has nothing to do with the uh, critical point or anything. Do you agree with that? Mm. Uh, okay, so in a sense, I agree. Um, but uh, also, uh, if there is this uh, non monotonic behavior, uh, there must be some region uh, where the system, I mean, yeah, actually, we, th 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 this, this region we can consider as the sep separation point between relativistic uh, system and a non relativistic system. Well, I was kind of, so you, you consider this a relativistic effect. So basically, if I would paraphrase what I thought I heard, at low root S, as the energy increases, the vorticity increases because the angular momentum increases. And as I go to higher root S, then things uh, stretch out, boost invariant, and so the local vorticity goes down. Is that right? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, last question, sorry. Um, I think one thing you said is that this thing ought to vanish when the total angular momentum is, you know, zero. And that would be when root S is twice the proton mass. I mean, I guess the Hades result is at 2.5 GeV, so the angular momentum is not zero. So right. the, the, production, the production threshold for lambdas 
is not the same as twice the proton mass. Would I expect this thing to vanish at twice the proton mass or at the production threshold for lambdas? Mm. Oh, you mean the production threshold for lambda is about to 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 twice the proton? It's it's mass. more than I mean the production threshold for lambdas is more than twice the proton mass. Mm. And so I'm just wondering where I think this should vanish. One thing you said was the angular momentum is zero if the relative momentum between the protons is zero. That's for sure. But mm. so I, would, I could expect a zero vorticity there. Should I expect a zero polarization of the lambdas at their threshold? And maybe I'll answer myself, since you're plotting vorticity up top and nothing to do with lambdas, you are actually implying, I think, that it should go that it should vanish at twice the proton mass. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Okay. yeah the calculation shows that only at uh, twice the uh, proton mass, the vorticity is uh, strictly zero, okay. uh, which means uh, uh, for lambda production threshold, which is above twice proton mass, which means even at that threshold, uh, in principle, <laughs> ideally, the producer lambda uh, should be somehow polarized. Good. Not zero. I mean, it, strictly speaking, not not. Uh, if we trust the trust the vorticity interpretation for the spin polarization, then it should be non-zero. Although it would be very tiny. Sure. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um. Just as a comment, because this is this, can I? This is a very interesting point. Mm -hmm. But I think that this is an effect of using transport to calculate this, right? I mean, the, point, the point is, I mean, this threshold is normal atomic dependence due to thresholds. The point is that um, the, if I understand correctly, the point is that below threshold, the degree of equilibration of lambda with other particles um, becomes much lower. The mean free below threshold, the mean free path for lambda equilibrating just becomes much lower because of threshold effects. And therefore, any kind of transport related model with suppressed vorticity. Is this what is happening, or am I misunderstanding? Uh, I'm not sure because in our calculation, we didn't calculate uh, lambda polarization. What, what we calculated is just the vort vorticity. Ah, I see. I see. So I did misunderstand. Okay, thanks. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So any other question? Nobody has questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, everything is clear. Any question? I mean, uh, I mean, just as a sort of follow follow up. Still, I mean, this was calculated with transport, right? Yes. Yeah. This might be just so that since, if experiment, if experiment finds that lambda polarization doesn't decrease its threshold effects, this would be a hell of a lot of evidence that. The hydrodynamic limit is reached up is reached um, a, a, a independently of transport. It's not really a it's not really a system of billy. I'm saying this because maybe star will maybe will come out with lower mm -hmm. thing where hydro works very well and transport works really badly mm -hmm. like water mm -hmm. hydrodynamics is hydrodynamics is greek for the dynamics of water and mm -hmm. transport involved mm -hmm. <laughs> because part of the model mm -hmm. <laughs> i see <laughs> right Thanks for the comment. So any other questions or Masood? Hadi? No question? Okay, if there
There's no quite there are no questions. So uh, let us thanks again, uh, Huang. Uh, thank, you thank you very much for you. preparing and uh, discussing with us and uh, you join us in uh, yeah. our next uh, meetings and so on there's always in uh, every two weeks